Uh, come on down a little bit. I mean, being an old preacher, but I guess other people will come in. I'm glad to be here. Uh, and, uh, I, I, under the heading of full disclosure, uh, I don't do software. Although I was on ARPANET, which was prior to internet, and my first computer was running CPM, and since then I love to use this stuff, but I don't have a clue what you guys do. So just get that straight. Um, and those who know me at all uh, will understand I'm a storyteller. And if you understand storytellers, you will also understand that they have a very light regard for the truth, as in historical truth. But on the other hand, if the story is a good one, uh, it may appear that the truth pops up every now and again, but that's your judgment. So I am a storyteller, and uh, you just have to take that as a caveat. And closely related to that is virtually everything I have to say in multitudinous circles is simply either impossible or heretical. Uh, I don't think it's impossible and I don't believe it's heresy, but the received tradition would view it differently. So uh, I warn you, please, <coughs> please do not believe a thing I say until or unless you try it. And it makes some sense. I don't mean intellectually just think about it. I mean, actually put some of this stuff to work or open your eyes and see if it's just working all by itself anyhow. Um, it, it was said that I, uh, I think, created open space. If any of you know what that is, it's a very simple way of doing things. And the truth of the matter is I didn't. Um, it happened. There was two martinis. And uh, it suddenly appeared to me that if we would simply sit in a circle, create a bulletin board, open a marketplace, and go to work, um, good things could happen. We did that in 1985 in Monterey, California, so it's been around for a bit. And um, I have to confess that for five years it didn't make any sense to me at all. I mean, by every standard of management, meeting management, or anything else, you don't take X number of people, put them in a room, and then 10 minutes, have them effectively operating in highly complex and constructive sorts of ways, and furthermore, go and take a nap, which is my normal practice. That can't happen. But 300,000 iterations later, over 27 years in 136 countries, I hate to inform the uh, established wisdom, it did happen. So I raised an interesting question. Um, why? And that's really what I'd like to talk about. Not under the heading of telling you all the fine details, I've written reasonably extensively, but my interest, frankly, is to raise questions. So most of what I'll have to say is come out, will come out in bald, unsub unsubstantiated statements, which I understand is a totally questionable practice, but as far as I'm concerned, if one or two really naughty, good, grubby, miserable, lovely questions stick somewhere in your head, the mission will be accomplished. Because questions, as far as I'm concerned, are just so infinitely more valuable than answers. They don't even come up on the same page. For whatever it's worth, we've turned into an answer society and largely forget, forgotten the questions and largely forgotten the value of questions. But questions create space, answers create no space, period points. So if I can engineer a few questions, uh, space starts to open and you start thinking in maybe some different ways. Um, the answers may take you the rest of your lifetime. So I gotta read something because I wrote it and I can't remember it. Um, Joe Kratz asked me to write a statement about what it was I was going to do. This was in Maine. I ordinarily spend most of my time on the boat, so this was very hard duty, but I tried. Um, and I started thinking about not agile software. I mean, I've known you guys for years, but what you do is a mystery. 
So I'm not going to talk about that. I don't know anything about that. But I do know about large organizations. I spent, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 years in the middle of them. So I'm mostly going to talk about organization and how we think about it. But I think you will discover that that may have some very direct applications to the way uh, you do your business uh, in the midst of those organizations. So here's, here's my bold statement. Organizational agility, I'm just talking with software, but the capacity of large systems to adapt and change rapidly to changing environments is a natural act. We don't create it. And we have only to let it happen. I told you this would be heretical. Could it be that we're working much too hard? I mean, think of all the hours we spend on design and planning and sequencing and getting to the plan and meeting the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that much of what we work so hard to accomplish doesn't need to be done. I mean, what do most managers spend most of their time doing? Management. Well now, if management is effectively a product of the system as a whole coming out of itself, something's a little odd here. And even worse, suppose it's true that all our hard labor under the heading of managing, controlling, restructuring, devising, keeping things on the numbers and the course, actually creates most of the problems that we seek to solve. And then, I think the juicy question, could there be a better way? Well, uh, now you ask, how could I possibly say such a thing? I mean, anybody who's spent any time in any MBA program understands, well, you understand. What is an organization? An organization is three or four silo towers loosely united by whatever command and control structure run totally from the top. Now we have, you know, more whatever pleasant ways of talking about it, but by and large that's the way it seems to work. Is that what I'm talking about? Well, I said, and I say what I'm saying, on the basis of, well, I'm 76, and in one way or another for the last 55 years, I've worked in, around, on, consulted to, written about organizations. Am I right? God knows. But I've been there. From major federal agencies to major corporations to governments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And on the basis of all of that, I have come to three, for me, firm conclusions, which I share. I'm not going to try and prove them at this point, but at some level, when you hear them, I think, you'll see I don't have to. And then just to be nasty about it, if that's true, then maybe there's a QED here somewhere that you could follow one. But the conclusions are as follows. All systems are open, including all human systems. Now, the notion of a closed system is a wonderful fabrication of the mind created by the scientific community to eliminate disturbing variables. But every single scientist worthy of his or her soul understands the system is never closed. You just hope that whatever breaks through happens at a level beneath the, the, the level of disturbance, I mean of, of perturbation. And if you happen to be working in radioactive material and you get a few odd bosons, or we now have bosons, don't we? Yeah. Um, or whatever, breaking through, more lead. But the system is always open. <coughs> Now, one of the things that, one of the reasons we invented closed systems was to, quote, control variables. 
And way back at the turn of the last century when scientific management was emerging, they took over science, including the notion of closed systems, and made, I think, the totally egregious error of assuming that systems, human systems, could really be closed, which then meant you could really be in control. However, if the system is always open, control, as most of us have either been taught or hoped for or something, it's not a matter of being illegal, immoral, or fattening. It's simply non-existent. Now, for you computer nicks, of course, you design and control your system, right? Wrong. First user shows up. It's all open, baby. <laughs> okay? So, point number one, all systems are open, including all human systems. That goes for governments, corporations, agile, whatever. Secondly, all systems are self-organized. Not a little bit, not on the edges, but fundamentally and profoundly through and through, beginning to end, top to bottom. This is actually just a corollary of the first one. To the extent that all systems are open, they are constantly in interaction with their environment. And they got a choice, adapt or die. Darwin had it right. I mean, not he wasn't the first one. But the constant practice of adaptation is what self-organization is all about. And curiously enough, it is not a function of the leader. Never a function of the leader. It's a total system function. There is no leader in an ant colony where you say, well, poor old creatures. Well, I would go further and say there is no leader. There are people who have the title, but there is no leader in a human organization. There is the total organism, which works like all other organisms on this planet. Surprise. So all systems are open. All systems are self-organizing. And then the last one, which in a way is sort of the sum of the preceding two, everything is moving. Now, we tend to think of systems and the world we live in as a set of structures, things that we move around in the chair and sit on or whatever. And you know, that's just delusion. It's all flowing energy. You ever heard of E equals MC squared? This is physics 101. And the notion of structure, like my department or whatever, is simply a figment of our imagination. I'm not saying it doesn't have any utility, but the utility is structure is neither more nor less than a freeze frame capture of a moment of flow. And you say, quite understandably, fair enough, but that chair's still there, that's true. But in galactic time, that's just a bunch of molecules here today and gone tomorrow. It's all flowing energy. And the same would be true of any mountain anywhere. Now where this really gets interesting, at least as far as working with human systems is concerned, we're talking about a degree of interconnectedness and complexity to say nothing of rapidity of change that is totally unthinkable. You can't think at that level. I mean, anybody, any CEO who ever says, I'm in control of my organization, is implying that they actually know what's going on. Right? Now, <laughs> tell me about what happened in Greece this morning. I don't know what happened in Greece, but something did. And it affects your bottom line, I'm sure. Did you know about it? No. Could you have predicted it? No. All right, all systems are open. All systems are self-organizing. And everything is moving. 
Now, as denizens on this planet, you and your job working with, well, your corporations, or, and indeed Agile itself, it strikes me as I've, I've watched you over the years, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not close to you, but I certainly have watched you over the years, and it's moved from, wow, to it's almost become a profession with departments, and not quite, but anyhow, what I want to suggest is that if those three things are true, then our problems at just working in this world begin with how we view our organizations as structures. You know, it's, you ask somebody, what's your organization look like, and you typically get the organization chart. Um, and you say, what's this job look like? You'll give them the structure. Now occasionally we say, right, we're going to do it as a flow chart, but that's a misnomer. It's just boxes and, and arrows. Isn't that flow? It's the figment of the imagination of the freeze frame of what is flowing. And then how we organize. Isn't that interesting? This is called organizing a self-organizing system. What we do is we design and structure. Now, being a little facetious, organizing a self-organizing system is not only an oxymoron, it's stupid. And it's stupid simply because the component elements, or more accurately, the ambient flows, are so complex, evanescent, masterfully powerful, infinitely small, hardly visible, definitely on whatever. They're trying to put all that together in a design. You know, lots of lecture on it. I mean, I'm not saying you all are stupid. I'm just simply saying that's mission impossible. Um, in quite the place, but. Every now and again, I give the same speech to a bunch of executives. And I said, you know, as I understand, the half-life of an executive is getting shorter and shorter. And that's no wonder. You guys signed up for Mission Impossible. You have the outrageous task of sitting at the head of your board table and saying, I'm in charge. Now that is a blatant lie. Now, I don't mean you're a nasty liar, I'm just saying <laughs> there's no way that could be true. And furthermore, to the extent that you try and do it, what happens is not only do you fail in the mission of being in control, you actually screw things up worse. So, and that comes under the heading of how we or how we uh, deal with our organizations, which is called command and control. Now, it's not that control is bad. Every natural organism has controls. Essential. But there are appropriate controls. They're emergent controls. They come out of the natural organic function of whatever system that is, whether it's an ant or a corporation or whatever. They will change. They can be very strong, they can be very weak, they can be subtle. They're very much there. But they aren't arbitrarily imposed for a very simple reason. You can't think at that level. And what you can't think about, well, you can't do a very good job, can you? Okay, so I made the further outrageous statement to the effect, I guess, that um, most of the organizational pathologies that we experience, and I would argue that at the level of organization development, if you will, the extent that software people like you, agile people, are trying to make your organization better, I understand you do software, but there are people there. <coughs> Most of the problems you're having, we may. Harrison, maybe. I'm good.
go even further and say, if you were to sit down and design the quintessentially perfect system, and I mind you, you can't do that, but let's say you try, to inhibit emergent leadership, reduce creativity to virtually non-existence, uh, absolutely eliminate innovation under any except the most exigent circumstances, and produce a situation in which people were feeling closed up, nasty, mean, frustrated, and bored, you simply couldn't do better than the current organizational model. Perfect. What do I mean? Well, one of the things we know about any living system is that it only can effect effectively exist with massive interconnection and freedom to the environment. It has to breathe. It has to exchange functions inside. That flow, which is what it is, has to be maintained, and when it stops, it dies. Okay, now put that in the context of need to know. Put that in the context of silos. Put that in the context of departments. Put that in the context of narrowly defined disciplines. Put that in the context of, well, what's your, you know, interesting thing. Just sort of experimental data, but with you know, hardly right. I worked in homeless organizations where very often people say, okay, we need some help with our morale problems. So we have this communication problem. Nobody talks to anybody. Everybody hates everybody. They're all suspicious. So we do this wonderful thing called an open space. Which if you haven't done it, you'll do it. And, uh, you know, it's really complicated. You sit in a circle and create a board, board open marketplace to go to work. In their case, it's usually about, I don't know, how do we build a business we'd really like to be a part of? It could be something else, but that'll do for a start. And within 20 minutes, this nasty, cantankerous, non-creative, totally useless organization by everybody's testimony is alive. All of a sudden, you find people who haven't said a word in years talking. They're just babbling. They don't need a facilitator to help them to do something useful. They're intelligent. It's amazing. And by the middle of noon, they're ecstatic. And then at the end of one of these things, and they just, you know, kind of made a major product design. I mean, the day you guys learn, I said this 20 years ago, and I'm just, that's why I'm really delighted to meet some of the, the, the Agile community. I said 20 years ago, the first time the tech community understands the power of self-organization and gets out of the way and lets it happen, is going to be massive. I mean, I said it in terms of open space, but, so that's beginning to happen. But you're hanging on at the edges, I think. You still want that control, right? I mean, I, I saw all that in there, and that's nice. The guy, a caffeinated Ozzy, is amazing. <laughs> he was wonderful. I mean, he's very good. I loved it, but wow. <laughs> um, so anyhow. <laughs> I'm sorry. It, it, it is true, I think, that uh, it, you just open some space and allow the system to be what it already is. And it does amazing things. You know, the initial respect, I mean, I, I was talking about not a method, but I, I had a branch of the World Bank, large branch of the World Bank, responsible for um, economic policy in Micronesia. And they wanted to do an open space around the development of some economic model or something. I forget what it was. And the guy who was going to do it got sick, so could I come in and do it? And I said, sure. This is 250, 300 economists who had the reputation of being the meanest, nasty, most aggressive, terrible division in all the World Bank. And everybody gave us an example. They would hire a consultant, chew him up, spit him out, and go and have lunch. And that was the way they liked to work things. So anyhow, unbeknownst, I fell into that. 
We started out, you know, sitting in a circle, created a bulletin board over the marketplace. And it was amazing. Nobody screamed, nobody yelled. There were lots of arguments. You can't get two economists together without a good argument. It's like I've done a lot of work in the Middle East. You can't get two Jews together without having 65 opinions. But um, so it was hot and bothersome for sure. But it was flowing and hot. And the next day it got down to business and they designed whatever it was and went home and they were happy. And when I was sitting with them at the end of this, I said, you know, you guys, you really are traveling under false pretenses. I mean, everybody in the World Bank knows you're the meanest, nasty people on the face of the earth and you take that with pride. But you've just demonstrated you're actually pussycats. Just pussycats. Yeah, and there was a sort of dumb grin oh, across 250 people. So, at a very practical level, time and time again, I've seen what happens when all of a sudden close space is open. And then somebody says, yeah, this was wonderful, then we have to go back to reality. And then being the nasty person that I am, I say, I think this is reality. I think what you have done is deluded yourself into a totally non-functional environment and thought frame. Now, if you want to go back and be miserable, please be my guest. But I continue in the belief or fallacy or fantasy or heresy. All systems are open, including all human systems. All systems are self-organizing, including all human systems. And everything is, mo everything is moving. And our task, if those happen to be true, is not to design and control the system. You can't do that because they're open. It's not even to organize the system because that's a waste of time. It'll do it much faster and quicker by itself and more effectively. And since everything is moving, just about the time you get that last strategic plan done, guess what? It was out of date before it ever got done. So am I telling you anything you don't know? No, I don't think so. All right, so just for the sake of the argument, presuppose that some element of what I'm saying is true. Um, What on earth would you do with that? You know, concretely. I mean, there are people, and I'm sure there are a number of such people here, who when I go through something like that say, you know, we just let everybody do whatever they wanted to do, nothing would get done. Well, when you really actually look at how things get done, do they actually get done the way it says in the book? I've never seen that happen, ever. I spent a lot of time at the National Institutes of Health. And uh, we had a number of Nobel laureates. And I had a question for them, which was, have you ever seen, either in terms of your own science or anybody else's, any scientific breakthrough that ever happened according to the plan? whatever the plan was. You know what the answer was? Zero. Every single significant scientific breakthrough was an accident. Period. And it's a funny thing. We tell the story of Arthur Fleming discovering penicillin because he failed to follow lab procedures. Remember, he didn't do his dishes so it, that everything turned green. And then he had the well, the perception that funny thing was no bacteria grew at, at where the where the mold was, and then he got penicillin. But the truth matters. He didn't do follow the plan. Okay. So just think in your mind. To all the projects and things that you belong, did any of it ever happen according to the plan? And I frankly, I, I, what I, I know happens is 
didn't happen according to the plan, but afterwards you and rationalized it so that you followed all the steps and you consulted the consultants and you did the appropriate tests and so forth and so on. Which is how we teach our students science happens. That's a travesty. Science happens when somebody says, oh shit, that happened and it shouldn't have. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the way it happens. It's called self-organization. Yeah, I want you to start to discover, I mean, we have all these lovely videos of self-organizing bird flocks, self-organizing ant colonies. And why do we have to turn it over to the ants? We do just as well. Somebody will say, oh, but this is a very nice idea. Maybe you can do it with two or three hundred people. Um, what about really big systems? I use, this is one of my favorite terrible things to do in a business school. And somebody asked that question. I said, okay, well, let me ask you a question. Uh, actually, I want to give you a problem, and I know you guys can deal with it. Um, I want you to design me a system that will feed eight and a half million people every day, virtually anything they want to, any time of the day or night, and always have two weeks food supply on hand, go. All right. Now, I jack them up a bit with, I know you've read all your systems theory and project design and so forth. So I know you're up for this one. And when I see them just start to sweat, either because they actually think they're doing it, which is delusion, or know that well they can't, which is reality, I say, you know, this is nasty, I shouldn't have done it. Because the system already exists. It's called New York City. Nobody designed the feeding system for this city. Nobody could control it. And anybody who tries is going to be canned. Period. And then you can extrapolate that to the whole feeding system of the world. Now, are there glitches? Sure. Could we do it better? Sure. But we're not going to do it better by organizing it so much. What we can begin to do, and here's one of the lessons I think that we begin to find as you start looking and working with self-organization, is you stop it. You might be able to guide it and deflect it but you will never control it. So, you know, we have a public health department, and at their best, what they do is corral it, but it won't work until the system as a whole agrees it's a good thing. You know, getting to Maine is not too good. So, we'll agree, we'll have day old food. Okay. So, up front, I'm saying, Anybody says, okay, Harrison, that was a nice idea, but it's, it's totally crazy. I say, well, think of your own experience. When I say it's all self-organizing, think about your experience in your place of business, your work team, your software project, whatever. Did it happen according to the plan, or did it emerge? Then ask yourself another question. What was the most powerful and expressive? Was it what was planned? No. It's when all of a sudden, totally serendipitous elements came. You know, the janitor said, and you thought, and, and somebody, you know, some totally other system, doesn't know crap from him, whatever, said, ask the, the stupid question. And all of a sudden, the light goes on in your head, and you say, yes. Was that playing? Yeah. So, one of the things we might start to learn is, you can't control it, but we could learn to go with the flow. You know, we could actually, I like this phrase, it's one of the few things I wrote. And it goes sort of like this, like fine. Try this. Supposing we could learn to live with our organizations as they naturally are as opposed to the way we might ideally want them to be. To learn to honor, celebrate, and leverage the power of fully living, self-organizing systems, which we did not create and cannot control. 
something about flowing with the river of life, if you want to be poetic. Now, here's, here's the kicker. Truthfully, you don't have any choice. Truthfully, you do not have any choice. Unless you pick a different planet. This phenomenon of self-organization, as near as anybody can figure out, has been going on for 13.7 billion years. It's the way we are. It's why all of you are here. We don't have any choice, but, and, and, and that's true. So we're all self-organizing, we're all going with the flow, but the truth of the matter is some will do it with elegance and style, some will do it kicking and screaming, and some will sit on the beach while it goes by. All right? I think we have an awful lot of kicker and screamers. But the folks who really get the heavy stuff done are the ones who either consciously or unconsciously have learned that when you face the mighty river, which is an organization or an industry or the whole world or whatever it is, Swimming against the tide doesn't make a great deal of sense. But learning how that flow can be leveraged to some kinds of purposes is useful. And we can do that. So, is there any concrete evidence that what I'm saying outside of, you know, your own experience that actually that's the way things are happening? <coughs> but, what would it look like to, I mean, this is a major figure ground switch, if you think about it. We assume, and we've all been taught, myself, everyone, organization is what we create and we control. That's our job. That's what we do. Self-organization, actually, it is does show up in the management literature, but always in a funny footnote that talks about the informal system. And there's one footnote in a large management textbook that I've forgotten the name of, so just love. Down at the bottom it says, um, the informal system, and there's a definition. That system that employees use to get their work done. <laughs> Now here's 800 pages on how to organize the system and two lines devoted to how things actually happen. You see, this is not new stuff. It's just a massive conspiracy theory. I'm not a conspiracy but I bet if you know, what else are you going to call it? <clears throat> so, what evidence do we have that something like what I'm suggesting could actually work? Well, I think that our 27 years experience with open space can make some suggestions. Now, I, it, when we started out, I didn't know, I have any idea what I was doing. And it's taken me a number of years to sort of figure out what was happening. And at this juncture, I don't look at it as a good way to have meetings, as it is. But for me, it's just a wonderful natural experiment in the intentional engagement to the phenomenon of self-organization. And that's what you do when you open it up. And what can happen? Well, let me just tell you a couple of things. You'll have the experience. Most of all, don't believe any of them. Try it. But two examples of quit. One which shows you the size. Um, some years ago, I had 2,108 German psychiatrists uh, for an open space at the end of their biennial meeting. This was their opportunity to reimagine the discipline and chart the future. Okay, so 2,108 German psychiatrists sitting in two circus tents. I mean, that's a lot of people. And there's me. I don't speak German. Fortunately, they spoke enough English. But this is not rocket science. You know, this is not about teaching everybody something new. This is about helping them to remember what they already knew and are. All right. Ten minutes. That 2,108 people who started out just, we were talking multiple big circles, 
They're standing up and proposing, creating a bulletin board, issues they want to deal with. In 25 minutes, my German colleagues, I don't do stuff like this, but they have to watch the numbers and check the watch. 25 minutes, that group posted 236 concurrent work sessions. All right? Which they then totally self-managed over the next eight hours. This all took place in one day. At the end of which, there were computer-generated reports for each session, which were in the hands of all participants before they left. You know the technology, how you do that. All right, just notice. There was no advanced agenda. I didn't speak German. I attended no sessions. As a matter of fact, most of the day I took a long walk in the night nice nap. This was in Wurzenburg, in a very pretty town. They did it all by themselves. Now, talk about complex organization. I'm sure all of you have experience of, of organizing meetings. If you were to plan 236 absolutely relevant sessions for 2,108 people showing up tomorrow morning, go. And then you see the magnitude of the job. But the system did it itself. Okay, so that's just a conference. Let me tell you another story. In 1995, um, and I have told this story, and any of you have read my stuff, you will have run into it, but it makes sense. 1995, AT&T, along with a lot of other people, were making um, uh, pavilions for the Olympics in 96 in Atlanta. And AT&T um, had an exquisite design team, 23 people. Um, and uh, they worked very hard for 10 months, came out with a design, turned it into the Olympic Committee, and the Olympic Committee said, wow, this is great. Would you consider moving your pavilion from the edge of the global village to dead center? Now, at this point, it's just a piece of paper. And AT&T, which is about ready to spend $200 million for one thing called exposure, said yes. What else? The problem was, this decision was taken in December. Olympics effectively start in June. You gotta have buildings. And that always happens, but you should have buildings. They do, it, and they were basically back to square one because on the periphery, they could anticipate 5,000 visitors, dead center, 75,000 visitors. Needless to say, structure built for five and gonna make it for 75, back to square one. So, this is a mission impossible, right? Because they still had to build the building. I mean, you start counting 10 months from December to June, doesn't work. Take off two more months for Christmas and New Year's, it works even less. Okay. So I got 23 very skilled and some quite famous architects, security people, whatever it is to make a big thing, sitting in a circle in Armand, New York, knowing that they're about ready to die. Right? You can't do this. Whereupon they walk into the room and all they see is a circle of chairs, a blank board, and, and some handwritten signs with four principles of the law. And I walk in, I had a ponytail at that point. None of them had any idea who I was. Okay, 10 minutes flat. We went from, hi, I'm Harrison Owen, welcome to Open Space. We're here to design the new pavilion. 10 minutes later, they're standing up, posting stuff on the wall. I won't take you through the whole time because those of you who have been in open space will recognize the drill. Those who haven't, you will. Five o'clock on the second day, everything stopped. Not because it was five o'clock, but because it was done. They had a totally new design down to the level of working architectural drawings, which they all agreed aesthetically was better than the one before. It was further ahead in terms of implementation 
Then the other one, because as they were doing the design, they were on their cell phones, they had steel and stuff hit the ground in Atlanta. And my observation, which they recognized, but it wasn't a major one for them, was that they still liked each other. And we've all had, you yeah, know, seriously, they're hugging and kissing. And we've all had, you know, teams, you run to the wall, you get the job done, and they all want to kill each other. Okay. Now, you figure this is an increment of productivity. I know I'm coming through 30 seconds. This is 10 days, now done in two months. Excuse me, 10 months, now done in two days. My math's a little foggy, but how about the 15,000% increment in productivity? Now obviously, if you walk into any office and say, how about that, okay. But that is at once, I think, an indication of the potential that's here. It is also an indictment of the way we currently do business, which is just a travesty on the human spirit. You got that on video? Thank you. <laughs>